All right, so we're back from the podcast. I totally just lost my spot in the book, but um, this is the book I was talking about, Ed Milet, The Power of One More. Um, I don't want to show you my house right now because it's a mess. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but I have my little backdrop of divorce. Losing the microphone, divorce diaries. Uh, with, the, with the amount of, it's such a mess right now, okay. The amount of awards that we've been winning, um, there's more than the ones that I have listed in the backdrop if you're looking on the YouTube channel. Uh, we are nominated... Uh, for the, the the pilot that we shot last year, Proof of Concept, we are nominated for Best Episodic, blah, blah, Best uh, Episodic, and I have not any nominated. Can't talk. Can't talk. Um, Divorce Diaries, the TV pilot, is nominated for some awards this weekend in the Long Island International Film Expo. Um, I'm very excited because I am nominated for Best Actress, and my mom is proud. My, be the, by the way, my mom just texted me. Good morning. Good morning, smiley face. Uh, so I am going to revel in that positive energy. I'm going to go out to Long Island tomorrow morning. I'm going to be in the, the breakfast. I'm going to this breakfast panel for filmmakers. I'm excited. I am not going to sit in the money worries. I am going to revel in the positives in my life because at the end of the day, I said this, this is how, you know, you're just a stress ball. And I think to myself, I have to be honest with you guys. I did take like my pension out for my teaching and I, and I, I took it and I used it. It wasn't a lot because I was only teaching in the district I was at for six years. But like when I left, I took it out. I use it for investment in my pilot, investment in my daughter's medical expenses for her, for things that I needed. Um, I shouldn't say I, lo I, I, have, I have some, a very small amount left, but I had to use a lot this year um, because for, exp for living expenses, for living expenses and extra things, and, and it stresses me out. It's not that, like, I don't mind. I don't plan on retiring, but I need a safety net. I don't have a safety net right now. It's paycheck to paycheck. Um, you know, that single mom joke I do about the moms at school are like, oh, just, just scraping by. Like, the mom actually said that to me in the park. And I was like, no, actually, I'm not. And then deep down inside, I'm like, yeah, but I am. Um, but I'm actually really happy every day doing what I love. The only thing that gets in my way is the fear of money and losing things. And, and, and that is, that is a concern. So that's not something you should just ignore. No, but I, I think that the amount of anxiety put on it is too high. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I, I don't know why I'm sharing this. I, I, I'm sharing it, I guess, because I do post a lot about my positives and the awards and stuff, but you know, I am a person that sometimes feels, if not majority of the time has felt in her life that she's just not good enough. Um, but that doesn't stop me from pursuing what I love or trying to get there. Um, I feel like a lot of us feel this way, um, because not all of us become celebrities or get mansions. We just live in our, in our bubble, you know, we, or we live in our, in our, whatever our quote unquote status becomes. Right. Um, but if you have this internal status that you have made it regardless of it, then that's something that I feel like nobody can buy from you or take from you. Cause that's fucking pretty amazing. I'm going off on a tangent again, but the goal, the point is I want to revel in the positives and stay happy and excited about what I do have. And which is a lot of things. Um, so the point of this whole podcast today is if you'd like to book me, no, I'm um, I'm going to do some jokes about some of the material I have for tonight. I don't know. I'm, I'm looking hard for a new closer and I don't think I have it, but that's okay. I am a really happy person, but I am so high strung. I, you know, when you come see my set or you come see me perform, I feel like by the time I'm done, you're going to either need to do a line of Coke or take a Zoloft to catch up with me or calm down or feel at ease. Like I can't relax. Even if Jesus himself came down from heaven, told me smoke a blunt. I promise you, you won't get paranoid. Or if he put an IV of Xanax in a bath of holy water and made me bathe in it, I'd still be nervous if the bathtub was Clorox before I used it. I turned 40 this year and I'm blaming everything on that. No more accountability. I'm done. No, I'm sick of taking accountability. Okay. I'm throwing it all on the full moon. Okay. Mercury in retrograde. 
That's why my bank account's at zero. Roe versus Wade. That's why I slept with one of my exes without any condoms in hopes for a relationship. That's a fucked up joke. I don't know. I don't know why I'm going there. Okay. Look, I think everybody's pissed about that, by the way. I know I am. It's just like, because let's, okay. The majority of my life, men have not pleased me down there. And now it just feels like, and the one, one woman who voted, didn't it, wasn't it like one woman who voted for I, whatever? Like, it just feels like we get just, this this, this doesn't get any reciprocity. Can't talk. Plus, like, nobody wants to be told no, right? That's just a big thing. That's why everybody has a problem with everything. Nobody wants to be told no. That's when you have an issue, right? No, you cannot go into the plane without a mask on. And people are getting mad at that. You cannot perform if you're not vaccinated. Now you got a problem with vaccination. See this? Nobody wants to be told no. I think that's a major issue. You cannot get an abortion. It's illegal. Now people want to get, like, it's just, it, this, this is what I, my thought process is. Nobody wants to be told no. I am a single mom, which is why I always look like I just woke up. I'm a single mom and summer is the worst season for us because we can't afford shit. You have taken away the one prize possessed jewel of our day-to-day -day life. And that is free daycare, AKA school. So we're fucked in the summer. Everyone's like, how's your co-parenting relationship though? You know, you've been divorced seven years. Gotta be good. It's kind of like milk that goes bad. It's just, no. Like we had our run, it's good. And now I gotta sit with this fucking stank ass milk in the fridge because I decided to make cheese with it. That's weird and gross. Okay, that's a new joke. Co-parenting is the equivalent of how's your experience with the DMV? It's annoying and fucking tedious and you have to do it. I hate hearing divorcees say, my ex is my best friend. Bullshit. If your ex is your best friend, you married a gay man. Okay. And let me tell you something. I wish. Okay. Because then if I married a guy who came out of the closet, my daughter would most likely always come home smelling good, looking good, and everything in her book bag would be organized. And so she comes home. He never cleans her clothes. Her hair is out to hair. Like my daughter comes home with teased crimped hair with gum in it gum why would you how do you get gum in your hair how she's not like well, how did she get gum in her hair i don't know i was like so you weren't watching her okay great uh i'm trying to do so, so she with her dad for four days which means she's it's going to take her eight days to get back to functioning you know it's, it's not a big deal. It's just like, it's like co-parenting with my ex is kind of like when you let your friend borrow your really nice pair of shoes, it's just never coming back the way you gave it to her, you know, like she comes back with cat hair on her. And I said to him once, I'm like, what is she, what, what is your, like, it's like, I leave her at gray gardens for two days. You don't, you don't ever, ever meet people in your family that think they're doctors just because they had kids. So that everything you tell them, oh, it's fine. You know, they think they're doctors. Like my daughter has to take medicine and they think that she's okay without it. And I'm like, how do you know? Are you a doctor? No, but we had four kids. Right. So that makes you a legitimate biological doctor with a degree from Columbia. Awesome. Um, I don't know. This has pissed me off, but my, my ex's child support has not come through. Like I have not gotten child support in almost a month and actually, you know, I have to call them because I don't know what's going on. They were supposed to call me by today and nobody's called me. Add that to the list. Um, and he's like, oh yeah, the sec my, I told my ex-husband, like, you know, my child support hasn't come through and it comes to, it's actually technically, I think it's not his fault because his job, it, it comes through called, something called probation where the job, the employer has to take it out through the state, 
through this day, I think. I, so I didn't know how this actually works until now because now I'm getting fucked because a secretary that used to work for his business for years left and they can't find a person to take, like who can handle the job. So now my child support is suffering because they can't find a competent administrative assistant. So super. Did a whole bit about it on social media. I was like, okay, so should I just stand in your office's like parking lot and scream for my child support check? That would just, you know, be better than getting a delinquent letter. Like they sent delinquent letters to the job and to him. It's like, that doesn't do anything. A letter is going to be threatening to my ex-husband. He doesn't, <laughs> yeah. I mean, no letter to any man is threatening. Like, let's be real. A man doesn't look at a letter and says, oh my God, we do. Women do. We freak out. I, I'm telling you, I owe money on my taxes this year. And the second I see the IRS, I'm like, <laughs> like, and I'm paying it in a payment plan. There's, and there's nothing that they're sending me that's bad. I just see, I see IRS or I see a bill and I have a legit 30 minute meltdown about what's inside and I have to open it right there and then otherwise my anxiety will skyrocket through the roof. Are you guys getting that Zoloft ready? Cause it's coming. When you're, but when you're, but you know what he did do, I was really thankful for this. Um, he has been a lot better in sending like his half for extracurricular activities on time. So like my daughter's, um, uh, leotard for competition, gymnastics competition. She's starting right. And it's really expensive for this, these leotards, these leotards must like clean your whole body and your tuition for college for how expensive they are. Okay. Like, I don't even know where that's coming from. That's just random. $275. So he did actually Venmo me his half. I was so happy when your ex sends you his half for something, your child for your child. And it's on time. Like I'm every woman. That's how you feel. It's all in me. I can pay for groceries. I don't have to borrow from my mom. I love Latin men. I've told you guys this before. I literally, honestly, it's not even just Latin men. I like, li like any man usually that's not white. And it's honestly, I don't know what it is. I have not been attracted to Caucasian white, whatever you want to call it, a man in a long time. I, I was sort of attracted to this Greek guy, but when we started making out, I just lost it. It was like, and I also could not feel any sort of growth. So I was like, uh oh, I don't know. I'm just saying. Um, but the problem is I like the Latin men that have all, not just baggage, like they have a U-Haul full of stuff they haven't looked at from a storage unit in five years. And they pretend like it's not a big deal. They pay their monthly payment for the storage unit on time. They don't even have to deal with it. That's the kind of Latin man that I like to date. Like they have thick, thick mommy, daddy issues, scars all over their body. I am a seeing eye dog for emotionally unavailable men. I help guide them to their true love of their life, which most of the time is their mom or a dog or an experience with another woman or man. Um, it's my new, it's my new bit. And sometimes I have been told by men that I create stories in my head, which honestly I'm flattered by because I'm an actor. So that means they appreciate my craft. Um, I don't know. I, I guess the last guy I was with, I met through this divorce podcast. He, he, he met me. He found me through Instagram and I thought, okay, universe, this is the sign that I am not searching for it. Like they say, don't chase, don't look for it. It'll come to you. I'm not looking. It came to me. So I think, okay, this is a number one, a first grade sign, right? We, he, you know, he, I, we start talking and immediately I hear it in his voice. Now I am not good at a Latin accent. It usually sounds Lebanese. Michelle, what you're doing for the divorce community is amazing. <laughs> You know, I've said this before on the podcast before. This guy 
and I became friends and he would like love bomb me, but not love bomb me because we were just friends. He would like bomb me, you know, and he would do all these love bombs and then throw up an insult. Do you ever meet a person that does that? Like, Michelle, you're so amazing and vulnerable. I just want to learn how to be so vulnerable and self-expressed like you. But I don't understand how you're poor and you went to NYU. Yeah. Oh, all right. Michelle. And then it was, what was another thing he would say to me? Um, he'd say like, you like, he said that he actually said that he's like, you're, you, you're the only person I know who is talented. Like he, this is how he said it actually. So I'm fucking it up. This was on a, so he had multiple conversations over the span of like four or five months before we actually met. And because we, he lives in LA and I live in Jersey and and he hated New Jersey for some reason. I don't think he so much hated New Jersey. I just think that he didn't want to be with me, but wanted to fuck me at some point because I liked him and he needed to have somebody who liked him to fuck him because his ex-wife cheated on him. Um, you know, like the kind of guy that has an ego that, but hides it in his vulnerability. There's some really smart guys out there that know exactly how to get into a cuckoo, loving, empathetic, kind, but I'll fuck you up bitch's head and make them trust them. That's me. Um, and this guy does that. Like, I feel like he does that, but he also would be like, I don't have the time to do that. I am a working filmmaker. You know, he's a filmmaker and all that shit. Anyway. So he would, I, this is the thing. I'm trying to shorten this bit down because I have so much about this guy that I want to do on stage because he was such a hypocrite. Like he would do things like compliment me and then insult me. All right. Michelle, you're so vulnerable and amazing and self-express. And then I would do a sketch based off the stuff he'd say. And he'd be like, that's not cool. And I'd be like, but I'm self-expressed. Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think there's just so many things. Like, he, he was obsessed with his ex-wife. Um, I mean, the time that I spoke with him, I felt like, I mean, he, he could probably say I'm obsessed with everything. I'm obsessed with still talking about him. And, and I am. And the reason why I'm obsessed about, I'm not obsessed. I, the reason why I'm fixated on this whole, on what happened with between him and I was because it was the, he was the last guy I kind of had feelings for in the last year. And um, when I have feelings for a man and, and it doesn't work out and it, it hurts me, um, it takes me a long time to get over it. And I think he started to notice that when I was like still bringing it up months later and he was like, Oh, so then he was like, not my friend anymore. You know, I love when men are like, we're going to be lifelong friends unless you get crazy and you don't let go of my, my heart. Um, yeah, he was a dick. Uh, I don't know. I have to find a way to shorten it, but you know, he's short. So I was very happy though to finally, I'm starting to finally let go a little bit more. Like I need closure on everything. Like I need to have closure. And then if I need to have a swinging door of closure. So if one minute I feel like I got everything off my chest, I, I, but they didn't say exactly what I needed to say. I feel like I have to go back and say something else to get the response that I needed. Um, I know this is not healthy way of thought, but that's why I'm reading Ed Milet's The Power of One More, you know? So, I mean, that was the biggest thing. I think it's because he was such a hypocrite. It was like, we're gonna, he said, we're going to be lifelong friends, okay. And then I would say, but I think that there's more here. And we just keep pushing the fact, well, Michelle, I just want a friend to develop and be playful with. So, of course, he slept, sleeps with me and I sleep with him. I'm not denying that. I, I just think like guys do know a little, like they're not as stupid as we think. You know, a lot of people were like, oh, he was in it for the long game. I'm like, what's the long game? I mean, like he lives in LA, so there's pussy there. Like, I don't know why I was the one that he had, that was like the connection. But I also think that I, he knows I, I'm not with anybody else and, or I wasn't with anybody else. And um, I was really dedicated to like him. Like I really liked him. 
So for him, it filled his ego. Um, and he knew he wasn't going to do anything else except like be with me for that weekend, which in the, like now I look back, I'm like, oh, and I, even then when I got home, I was like, oh, wait a minute. He just did this because I live far away. And now he could drop me like a fucking hot potato. Like, and I can't come looking for him because I live 3000 miles away. Um, so it sucked, you know, I, I really, I mean, I definitely think that's what happened. And, and then of course, in the months afterwards, he refused conversations with me. You're going to heal the pilot trailer in a second. Okay. No, you're not. Um, and you know, now I'm just talking about this whole situation again, but I am working hard on a new closing bit for tonight. So stay tuned and see if I can record it and I'll put it on the podcast. Self doubt is something that I, I hope I can get rid of, um, soon. I think financially it will help if I, I, not financially, I think, I know people say like money doesn't buy happiness. It doesn't, but I do, do think that if I book a job for an acting job or book some more work in the next two months that, and it makes my, like, cause September picks up again with my, with my courses that I teach. Um, I, I do think it'll make things a lot less stressful for me and motivated. I, I, I hope, I hope, I hope we sell out in Richmond and we are in the big number one hope and goal for Divorce Diaries this year is to find an uh, investor so we could begin filming season one. And that is it. We are filming season one, six episodes, uh, possibly more if we get a bigger investor, but that's a big, big, big goal before the end of the year. And, um, you know, I know there's lots to be thankful for but it's a bitch sometimes when you're struggling with self-doubt stay tuned for more i'll let you guys know how tonight goes and this week in long island international film expo nominees we are nominated best episodic and best actress stay tuned for more keep living your happily divorced ever life stay tuned guys